Photographer, a design student, a creative person, and a hedgehographer. We'll get to the hedgehog part later. <laughs> so I'm going to start today by showing you guys a personal project I've been working on over the last year. It's called the Frozen Floral Project. And you can see here, um, it's taking flowers from my yard and just freezing them into ice cubes and photographing them. Um, so this is Japanese lithianthus, um, frozen leaves. Um, ice cubes with flowers from my landlord's garden. <laughs> and this one is frozen thyme, which really um, was a good topic for today's theme. <laughs> frozen thyme. And um, this is frozen thyme under the light. And here's a video. Is it playing? Back up. <laughs> No. <laughs> Time is short. <laughs> so this is a little video of light dancing over frozen time, and I think it's very poetic. So this is the things that I love to photograph. Like, this means a lot to me. It's, it's very beautiful. Um, it brings me a lot of joy. And what I really want to focus on today is my story behind my creative journey and how that led me to being here today, telling this to all of you. So I was born in Taiwan, in a village next to the sea. My parents immigrated to Canada when I was little. Uh, and then we moved back to Taiwan. I spent the majority of my life in Asia. So I worked really hard to perfect my Asian accent. <laughs> um, so in college, my Asian parents were so set on making something really amazing out of me, so they sent me off to medical school in northern China. Um, to this day, I don't understand that event. It remains a mystery to me. But if there are two things that I took away from medical school, it was that one, I was never meant to be a doctor. <laughs> and two, those five years were probably five of the most miserable and most inspirational years of my life. Um, I don't know exactly how I transitioned from doing medicine to creating art, but one of the strongest memories I had working in the hospital is that, you know, like that feeling of desperation when you're working with patients and you see them come in and they'll get denied treatment because they can't afford to pay for medicine or because their illness was really too terminal to be cured or you'll be operating in surgery and you'll be like seeing people that come in for third and fourth times because they just don't have the idea that they're supposed to take care of themselves in that way. So, um, I don't, uh, it was in that moment that I really started asking questions. I just knew that there had to be more to this. You know, there had to be more than cutting people open, sewing them up, sending them back home, having them come back again. And there has to be more than just doing what society tells us, what we learn in school, like pushing those buttons, and just somehow that just led to me creating art. Um, I'll say that my art began on a piece of white canvas in a communist country, in pollution, in smog, in chaos, and like utter craziness, and somehow like it just all makes sense. And for me, that's something I find really beautiful. Like, this is China. Whoa. <laughs> this is China. And it's like, you don't have to travel to mountains like this to find something beautiful. A lot of times, it's just like, you know, you find it on a white piece of paper. You find it in flowers. You find it in, like, beauty that just exists around us and things that we so easily overlook all the time. And that means, like, a lot to me. It really means a lot. One of my favorite quotes is from the Italian designer Massimo Vignelli where he says that the life of a designer, the life of an artist, is very much like the life of a doctor. As a doctor fights to save his patients' lives, the designer, the creative, fights to rid the world of ugliness. 
So that's something that means a lot to me. It's irresistibly beautiful, and it gives me a lot of hope. And I really believe that all of you sitting here today, you know, you guys are all creatives, you're artists, designers, illustrators, musicians, and you all understand that, you know, you have this drive in you to create, to make things. And you just like realize that time is precious. Like it's very short and it's almost like don't stop yourself from doing that thing. Don't be afraid of putting yourself out there because you don't know what will happen and just really hope for the best. And it's like, I'm not asking any of you to quit their jobs and move to the other side of the world. It's really crazy, but I wouldn't have created this journey for anything else. Yeah, so <laughs> to wrap up, I will show you guys a um, little, uh, my personal project number two that I've been working on with my partner who also happens to be a hedgehog. <laughs> she says hello. So this is Amelia Hedgehog. She is a African pygmy hedgehog. Um, and we work on photos together, like she'll chill on my desk while I work on my Mac and once in a while we'll just get together and make funny photos. So she is really nice. <laughs> you are nice. Um, and she's also really affectionate. <laughs> she'll say things that I don't dare say to people because she's a hedgehog and also she gets away with everything because she's so cute. Um, <laughs> She likes frozen flowers, obviously, and she does the cha-cha. <laughs> um, and this one is called, My Heart Beats For You. <laughs> and this is us supporting Paris. Um, she's very passionate about that. <laughs> Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> and this is us at Kitsilano Beach. We really like going to the beach. It always causes a great sensation. People are like, oh, you have a hedgehog. And it just keeps on going on and on. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's called, You Are an Ocean to My Soul. <laughs> and if one hedgehog isn't cute enough, you can always get two. <laughs> so one of the most popular comments on Amelia's Instagram feed is that people are always say like, oh my god, she's so cute, I'm going to die. And Amelia will always reply like, don't die. <laughs> So, not as an attempt to try and kill you guys today, I did bring Amelia with me today. Um, <laughs> she's under here. Oh, somewhere. <laughs> Can you guys all see her? So, she's very shy, well, shy in the beginning. So, this is Amelia Hedgehog. She's a little bit <laughs> over a year old. She usually comes up. Oh. She usually comes out in a little bit. Um, she's a little bit over a year old. I got her this time of the year, like for Christmas. Uh, a little information on hedgehogs. They are nocturnal. They have the diet of a cat and they live in a cage like a rabbit with wood shavings. Um, here, she usually comes out like this. So that's her face. <laughs> yeah, she curls into a bond. She gets a bit more spiky when she's scared, but she'll usually come out and explore. Uh, yeah, so she's very creative. She likes dark places like under my bed or under my armpit. <laughs> and she believes in endless possibilities and all the good things of the world. Yeah? Um, Amelia Hedgehog, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hedgehog. I don't know how I'm going to follow the cute hedgehog. Um, so, <laughs> thanks. So I wanted to talk a little bit about typefaces and their relationship to time today. But I'm going to start off a little bit about how my love of letters has evolved through time. So it got going at Emily Carr, where I made this typeface in a type design course. And I kind of realized that type design was an actual job that people did, and maybe I could be that one day. And shortly after I graduated, I got invited to Lettering Club, which is basically a bunch of nerds like myself who go to a restaurant, we roll up vellum on the table, get out a big bag of markers and just draw all over the place while drinking beer and eating pizza, because that's our idea of a really awesome Friday night. <laughs> um, so after studying letters in that kind of casual environment, I decided it was time to take a stab at my own typeface. So about a year ago, I started making a typeface that's it there. I'm still working on it, though, because typefaces take a really long time to make, apparently. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to talk about how typefaces are created in a specific time. And 
They're influenced by the knowledge, the visual style, and the technological abilities of that time. And we really need to acknowledge and appreciate the evolution of letters through time, but also maybe realize that modern typefaces might better express our current context, the context that we're creating in, than letters that have been designed either decades or centuries ago. And we've been drawing letters for a long time as humankind. And there's a surprising amount of ways to draw each letter. And that's really the interesting challenge of drawing a letter is making it recognizable as a letter, but also unique and different at the same time. And actually, it's really crazy. Um, we don't know how we read. Like, from a scientific perspective, we don't know what happens in our brain when we're reading letters. So it's really hard to define what actually makes a letter recognizable. And so as type designers, we're kind of relying on all this previous knowledge and stuff that's been working for centuries to figure out what actually makes a letter recognizable. And if we pull out a couple of these letters here, we can see how letters have changed through time. And each of these letters tells a story about the time and the context in which it was created. So typefaces, the first typefaces, they resembled writing of the monks. Because up until this point, books had been made by hand. They were all um, you know, ink and paper, very ornamented, calligraphic. And the first typefaces mimicked that so people wouldn't get like startled by this new thing that was coming out. And eventually, as the printing industry grew and people were reading more, we simplified the letters down. And they look a little bit more familiar to what we would recognize a typeface to look like today. They're still based in calligraphy with the shapes of ink on paper, but they're kind of um, moving in a different direction. And then letters become more structured. So we start putting pieces together rather than fully relying on just the pen strokes. And we're getting further away from mimicking writing as people get more comfortable with this new medium of print. And then we start getting really crazy. And we cut off all the serifs because at this time where design modernism is happening and where we want everything to be simple and plain and neutral and minimal. So that starts happening to our letters as well. And then we get screens. So screens are based on a pixel grid and the curves and the serifs don't show up quite as well. So letters get very horizontal and vertical and kind of almost more boxy. Why is this? Why did letters change so much over time? I think it's because designers design for their time. They design for their surroundings and for the technology that they understand and that they use. And the story of the phone book is a really great example of that. So in 1937, there was a typeface commission specifically for the phone book. It was Bell Gothic. And they used it for about 40 years because at the time they were printing with letterpress. But then the printing thing, oh, sorry. <laughs> the printing technology advanced and changed and they started having problems with this typeface because the thin parts started getting lost and um, they were trying to use this typeface in a context that it wasn't intended for. So they commissioned a new typeface and they tried to address some of the problems that the technology was bringing up. So one of these issues was that the new printing method used cheap paper. And when you put ink on cheap paper, it bleeds and spreads out. So one of the things that Matthew Carter added to this new typeface, Bell Centennial, was ink traps, which is basically anywhere where the letters join, they cut out an extra notch. And um, so when it gets printed on the page, it actually looks normal because the ink bleeds into those spaces. So, this typeface actually doesn't look like it's supposed to look until you print it on a page. In its digital format, it's kind of weird and funky. Um, and this is an example of how the intended use of a typeface can actually have an effect on the letter forms themselves. Which brings me around to revivals. So revivals is the evolution of forms within a single typeface as it gets remade over and over and over again for each new technology that comes out. It's kind of like a family tree. So you start with one really good looking person and they get married and they have kids and then those kids get married and have kids and it goes on and on until some of the cousins might be a little bit ugly. <laughs> it's just the gene lottery, it's gonna happen. Sorry, sorry Garamond. Um, Garamond has a lot of cousins. There's 59 versions of Garamond, 59 of the same typeface. And this is five of the more popular ones and you can see how much it varies, how much they overlap and and, you know, why is that? It's all based on the same typeface, but, you know, when a second designer has to redraw the typeface for a new medium, 
they have to reference printed materials, which, as we saw in the phone book example, different papers, the ink spreads differently, and the letters are going to look a little bit different. So it depends what printed material you're working on. Um, they also used metal types directly, so the actual metal that was used to print the letters on the page, or a combination of both sometimes. So everyone kind of had to guess the intentions of the original designer. Did he want it to look like it did on the page? Because you can't really call Claude up and be like, hey, Claude, what did you mean this typeface to look like? Because, um, you know, it was 500 years ago that he designed it. <laughs> and on top of that, they also have to consider their own context. So they're creating for a digital world, and they have to figure out how much to change to make the letters work in today. So we use revival typefaces a lot. Like, I'm sure most of you recognize the name Garamond. And with today's technology, we can easily catalog and use those typefaces from the past. But we need to ask, is it appropriate for the world that we live in today, the context of our time? How is it affecting the visual language? How will we, rem uh, how will we be remembered? What does 2015 actually look like from the visual landscape? And typefaces can add a lot to that. So maybe we need to consider some more modern typefaces in our work. And there's tons of modern type designers working really hard to meet the needs of today's readers and graphic designers. And uh, there's more founders than ever, over 150,000 fonts for download. Not all of those are awesome, but a lot of them are. And so I encourage you to check them out and consider looking at some fresh new typefaces for your work. Um, you might ask, where do I find all of these? I don't have time to go over it, unfortunately. But I will have a blog post that I'll put out afterwards, and I'll kind of list out where all the my favorite type foundries and fonts come from. So thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, there we go. Uh, so uh, I am Alan Pike. I run Steam Clock as an app development studio here in town. Uh, and at Steam Clock, we like to try new things, try crazy things. Um, but recently, things got a little out of hand. And in an unfortunate and crazy app development accident, I got transported into the future, forward in time, <laughs> into the year 2040. Now, as you can see, I'm OK. I'm back. It's all right. I survived. Uh, but I figured I would take this opportunity to share some of the things that I saw and things that I learned from the year 2040. Now, 2040 actually, like it sounds like a long time from now, but it was surprisingly, in some ways, similar to 2015. Uh, for example, uh, designers were still obsessed with putting birds on things. <laughs> that was still popular. Um, architecture was pretty similar. Buildings don't change that often. A lot of that stuff was the same. Um, but obviously more striking were the differences, and there were a lot of differences. And some of those were small as well. For example, male uh, hair fashion trends had changed, <laughs> uh, popular grooming. Um, but that's the kind of stuff, you know, just fashions, things go into and out of fashion. There's one really huge change that totally struck me and I want to kind of focus on today uh, because it's really fundamental to how uh, people live and work in 2040. Now, we're used to work changing, right? Technology uh, obsoletes jobs all the time. Uh, it's been happening since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is uh, Google's self-driving car, uh, pictured in 2014, and it looks ridiculous. <laughs> but it's less ridiculous than people careening around, driving into each other, and killing each other. So by 2014, this is the only way people are legally allowed to get around. This completely eliminates entire class of jobs, people whose job it is to drive people around, uh, and goods and all these sort of stuff. And this didn't just happen to driving. This had happened to a huge proportion. Actually, the majority of jobs that we think about today uh, were gone. They were, they were replaced by technology. Uh, generalized robotics replaced pretty much any job that, where the job was based around like physically doing things. Uh, and computers replaced pretty much any job where the idea was make smart decisions about stuff. Because it turns out computers are pretty good at that. Um, so this kind of started to cause a problem. We ended up with this incredible amount of unemployment. Um, and so what I was told is that by about 2030, about 2030 there was like 50% uh, unemployment. It turned out that it wasn't actually worth paying uh, humans minimum wage to do many things that technology uh, could do. So not surprisingly, there was some unrest. People were unhappy about this situation. Uh, but thankfully, uh, the world leaders got together and in the Vancouver Conference of 2033, 
they de decided that they were going to fix this problem. And they understood that minimum wage only works if everyone has actually like a full-time job, which wasn't necessarily the case anymore under that economy. And so they came up with an alternative solution, which is this idea of a minimum income. So they basically just said, all right, everybody is going to get enough money for their food and their further shelter automatically. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you spend your time. And then if you want to work on top of that, you can. That's up to you, and you can keep that money after some tax. And so in 2040, I was told this is kind of the way the world works now. And I was pretty skeptical. I mean, like, really? Like, I figured that if you just give everybody money, you're going to get a lot of people not, like, doing anything. Um, so I considered that, that, I figured that that was going to be a problem, but it turns out this actually didn't happen because people like doing things. People like making things. People like contributing. People are inherently motivated. Not all people, but most people are inherently motivated uh, to do things. And so this entirely new economy actually motivated entirely different types of jobs. Uh, and entirely new types of products that didn't exist pre um, previously. And a lot of those jobs ended up actually being creative jobs. Uh, this is one product that I really miss uh, now that I'm back in 2015. There's a primitive version of a digital assistant. Uh, this is a 2015 attempt to Facebook is trying to put a digital assistant into their Facebook Messenger. But, uh, and you're probably familiar with this if you've seen like Siri and these sort of things, you can ask it questions. And the thing that we're used to in, in 2015 is you ask Siri a question like, hey Siri, like, what's the weather? And because it's in Vancouver, it says it's, it's raining because we're in Vancouver. Uh, and this is just like a computer logic question. It's, it's rational, it's factual. But by 2040, uh, you can ask it any question. And if the question is subtle or uh, it requires creativity or novelty, uh, then the question doesn't actually go to the computers. It goes to the millions of people who are employed worldwide to add a sense of human unpredictability into the computer answers. <laughs> because it turns out humans do actually have some things that we're, that we're still really good at in, in 2040, which is uh, having that creative spark, having that sort of unpredictability that computers can't have. We can give an answer to a subjective question. Um, so you can ask in 2040, hey Siri, what do you think of this song that I'm working on? And it turns out that what would happen is that it would dispatch you to a talented songwriter somewhere in the world who'd be able to give you, listen to your song and give you awesome feedback. Turns out in 2040, that's actually a really common question that people ask Siri, uh, hey, what do you think of my song? Because given this new economy, people get to choose more or less often what they want to do, and a lot of people choose creative fields. You know, it's really challenging in 2015 sometimes to make a career doing the thing that you love. But if you support people and they have that safety net where they can try anything they want, a huge proportion of people, more than ever before, try you know, to make a career in music, to make a career in writing, to make a career in art, and do all these things. And it ends up actually being really amazing. There was this explosion through the 2030s of entirely new creative fields because people could try things without necessarily having to worry, am I going to be able to eat? Am I going to be able to pay my rent? Uh, and incredible new fields of creativity opened up. And so in 2040, if you decide, my life dream is to be a world famous emoji designer, then you can be a world famous emoji designer, or at least you can give it a try and it's not scary. Out of all these various uh, creative fields that came up, the one that really blew my mind the most and the one that I really uh, was just completely fascinated by in 2040 was the, the depth of art that was possible in virtual reality. This is something that's really hard to convey. I mean, I only have this really low-tech 2D projector here, so I can't really immerse you in some of these experiences. But it turns out what happened when artists were freed to be able to literally express any experience that the human mind can comprehend, it was amazing. I mean, in 2040, people don't even need drugs because you just like experience these crazy things that people have created, uh, these, these stories and these emotions that they can convey. Uh, and it's... It's amazing and really weird. It, it's weird. Uh, and, and I guess that's, that's kind of my point, and that's what I learned in 2040, which is that the future is going to be weird. But with a little bit of luck and creativity and humanity, it's going to be good weird. Thanks. <laughs>
same word type thing. Naughty dog. No. Good dog. I don't think. Oh, yeah, there, there we go. Thank you, sound guy. Um, <laughs> I probably have the same word type faces. I've decided that it's my dream to draw letters all day, every day, and then go around and talk about drawing letters all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> I would make a cool game, like a 3D game. I don't know. I, I, I played around with it. Turns out it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Uh, but if I had an arbitrary amount of time, I would definitely tackle that. Well, I've always wanted to go to India. <laughs> or travel back in time. <laughs> okay, so we've got some questions to challenge these kids. Hi, my name's Curtis, and this is a question for Alan. Uh, that whole, we had a really cool discussion out of the whole minimum income idea and the benefits that could have for people actually pursuing their like core passionate interests. What can we do as all people who actually care, who should, like woke up early to come to a talk like this, do to make that happen? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I'm not a pub pub public policy person. I'm an app developer, but uh, my, <laughs> vote for me. Uh, <laughs> I, you can write in the ballot sometimes. Uh, no, I, this is actually something that is in the discussion, like economists and to some degree politicians, but like most of the people who are, you know, sort of advise governments and do think tanks and stuff like that. There seems to be like some a fairly like popular opinion among people whose job it is to think about this stuff that this minimum income thing is a plausible thing that could happen. Um, but there doesn't seem to be, from what I've seen, any or many like mainstream major politicians that are campaigning in any country that I'm familiar with. I know that there's there's an experiment in Switzerland of some sort. In Alberta, there's two. In Alberta, there's two. Calgary, there's two. Alberta and Calgary, and they tried it in like some suburb in Manitoba in like the 70s. Like it's been tried little bits here and there, which is. Forty-five years ago, they tried. It. All right, so the Netherlands is doing it right now. So I'm not sure other than talking, I think probably at this phase, uh, for those of us who are not in, like, we're not politicians, I'm not sure if anyone here is a politician, uh, probably talking about it and spreading that idea uh, and getting it into the more popular consciousness um, probably is uh, one of the best things that we can do, that I can think of. Yeah. This is a question for Ola, uh, Lana and Alan. Do you have any ideas about what typefaces might be like in 2040? <laughs> <laughs> based, based on Alan's um, scenario. Mark Roman. <laughs> <laughs> More revivals. Um, well, I've actually been looking a lot at responsive fonts. There's a bit of mm. talk on that. Because um, we have responsive web design now, but you know, we still grab a font file for every like bold, there's a new font file, thin, there's a new font file. So we're loading up all these font files. But how designers actually make fonts now is you would you use something called interpolation. So you would draw the very thin, and you would draw the very bold, and then you let the computer pick all the middle ones. Like you set, you know, I want this one to be a certain width. So we have this, we're doing it in the designing phase of things, but in the actual part where we're using them, it's not quite there yet, I guess. So that's something we've been talking a lot about in the Type design world, I guess. Anything? <laughs> One weird thing that's been happening with typography as like our displays end up getting like way higher resolution, we got like iPads and retina displays and stuff like that, is that a lot of people are going back to like old print fonts. Things that looked good on print didn't necessarily look look good on screen and now they look better on screen. Um, but the one thing that like like tends to drive big changes in typography is new ways that you're looking at the text. So new printing methods, new display methods. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have like tried one of the VR headsets that we have nowadays, uh, but you can easily imagine that the typography uh, decisions that we make for putting it, something on a flat screen uh, don't necessarily uh, map as well into three dimensions as some alternatives. Maybe it turns out that you know in a hundred years people can't even like stand to look at a flat font because they, it's just way more expressive to have a 3D one. Like I don't know, but uh, that's the kind of stuff that tends to drive that is a change in the technology. Yeah, Hi, my name's Jack. This is a question for Alana. Um, even this discussion we just had now 
shows how much influence technology is having on type faces. Do you think we still see, and in the past decade or so, social and cultural events influencing typeface design? Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, I think a lot of the typefaces that are being now made now are kind of based on historical context because we built up this repertoire of all of this stuff. Um, I mean, there are cultural events like the Olympics that sometimes they get their own typeface made for that. There's uh, people are kind of, I guess, understanding that custom typeface is a thing. They can get a, a typeface made exactly for them. Uh, a number of universities get typefaces made exactly for them. So. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that. Um, and then that kind of brings a more specific personality to that typeface that that particular event or organization or cultural event is actually looking for. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen this question's for Alana again. Sorry. <laughs> um, other than one of your own typefaces, if you could only choose one typeface to bring to a dead aisle, which one would it be? Oh, no. I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to go to Two. Two? Oh, come on. Okay, Massimo Vignelli, who you did a quote from, he has used, I think, 10 typefaces in all his work. He didn't use any more. He kind of believed there was only these 10 typefaces that. But I don't know, I kind of believe in this, but there's always new, awesome stuff coming out, so it's like, we got to keep looking to what's in our context now and what's being created now. Um, yeah, it's an impossible question for me, I'm sorry. What's your favorite typeface right now? What's your favorite typeface right now? Um, I'm really liking Echo, uh, which is by Ross Milne. He actually lives in the Vancouver area and teaches at Emily Carr. I'm sure maybe some of you know him. Ross here today. Holy crap. Okay, going with Fina. Hi there. Um, I, I just was struck by the combination of speakers. I love that. We went everywhere from hedgehogs <laughs> by the beach saying I love you uh, to, to typefaces to going to the future. And I'm a psychologist, so I'm very interested in time in terms of how we think about um, uh, the positive uh, feelings about and optimism. And I love how when you're talking about 40 years down the road, a very positive perspective. Um, there's a book by uh, someone talking about shamanic, uh, the, the shaman said, and the book is called The World Is As We Dream It. And I was wondering if each of you could speak from that voice of optimism and thinking even about sustainability because, you know, if we're living with robotics and uh, typefaces where, you know, the environment where, where, where hedgehogs would want to be by the beach uh, would look different. So I wonder if each of you, including the hedgehog, uh, are you speaking for the hedgehog, might be able to speak a little bit about uh, what is the world that's, as you dream, as, as this uh, shaman said, you know, we created a lot of uh, these problems. And, and it was like, well, what do we do? And he said, well, the answer is easy. We just need to change what we dream. So I'm thinking here we have a community together. If we could pull together some new dreams that are positive and optimistic, uh, I'd love to hear what, what some of your dreams are. Um, I think when I started uh, my creative career, I definitely had a lot of fear. It's like, you know, what the world wants to see is someone really successful. It's like, oh, I have everything together. Um, and the truth is, I don't. Um, a lot of my work has been created in times where it's just like, oh, this is just awful. Like, it's the world, like, my day was bad. But somehow making art that turns something around and it turns into something really beautiful. And I think in my head, uh, I live in a place in the clouds where everything is white. Um, I have flowers and hedgehogs. It's, it's very nice, and I've always thought that I wanted to do a project called The Imaginary World of Amelia Hedgehog. It's just like, you know, it's very happy, it's very cute, it's funny, and it's positive. It's kind of like, you know, children's books. When you read it, it connects to adults, and it connects to children, because there's some kind of like purity and there's some kind of truth to that. And I think it's bringing more of that out, and really, you know, not caring about what this world is like, how they place their values, but really going back to the beginning and really focusing on things that are simple and cute and happy. That's my answer. <laughs> that was a really good answer. <laughs> I don't know what to add to that other than I would just hope that there's a lot of letters and typefaces. In <laughs> <laughs> in this beautiful world that she's been a photographer for that for us. <laughs> Um, I'm a pretty 
really optimistic person by nature, and so that's why I, I tend to gravitate more to talking about like, oh, here's some cool, interesting things that may happen in the future, uh, rather than uh, here's all the horrible things that will happen if we don't deal with the various problems that we have. Um, not that it isn't like incredibly important for us to be aware of the problems so that we can actually create the good version of the future. Um, but I think that the, the sort of fundamental thing about the way I think about it is this faith, uh, as you know, well guided as it may be or not, uh, that as a species that we are pretty good at improving things over time. And that sometimes we make mistakes and sometimes we kind of fall in a hole and things will get worse for a while. But the general trend is that we are able to evolve you know, faster than our genetics now. We're able to evolve by uh, you know, recognizing problems in our society and the way that we live and what we do uh, and then fixing them you know, over uh, our, the generations as they go by. And the ways that that has changed, we can often not predict the specific ones. And, and so I try to, you know, I went out of my box and out of my comfort zone and actually made some semi-predictions today. But in general, I try to just be optimistic um, that as long as you are participating in trying to make the part that you're familiar with, whether it's typography or hedgehogs better, um, then you're kind of contributing to that overall process. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Baldwin. Um, just a question, I guess, for all of you about the issue of revivals and how they tie into nostalgia and whether that prevents us sometimes from looking forward. Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go for it because I talked about revivals. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we're in a very interesting time right now where everything's sped up and we're moving really fast through everything. And um, I mean, you might call it hipster, but everyone's kind of going back and they want to listen to records. And Christmas time, especially, is a time where we kind of go back and try and slow things down and, you know, bring go back to family and all that kind of stuff. So, I think that is kind of happening happening generally in culture. So it's also happening in typefaces, art, anything. We're trying to express that, right? Um, I think eventually we'll get past it or we'll learn to balance maybe um, the speed at which we're moving with you know, where we're going. Um, yeah, so does anyone else have anything to add? One thing that um, seems to be happening with culture is that the pace at which we remix and revive previous trends uh, has accelerated. Uh, and I think part of that is just the, the media and our communication and our, our and that stuff is getting faster. Uh, you could imagine that it actually just gets a faster and faster loop, and so that what was cool last week is no longer cool this week, but it's going to be cool next week again. And that, you know, <laughs> you know, if everything is digital, then things can change that fast. Like I don't have to buy new clothes; I'm just like downloading the clothes of the minute, and they're just kind of rotating. And, <laughs> and there's a limit as to how much attention span that we have, but that's that's pretty much the limit when everything's digital. So you could imagine this process of of revival and revisiting things uh, actually accelerates rather than us, because this idea of modernism of like we'll eventually figure out the right way to do everything and then we just kind of stop and be perfect seems like that's obviously a ridiculous way to characterize modernism but like that that idea seems probably not i don't expect us to settle into some groove i think yeah that's my guess um, we're at time so i'm gonna get ready with oh, okay okay well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh. Oh. i thought you were moaning because there was one more uh, <laughs> I don't really have a lot to say to that, but I do agree with like you know being too digital, social media, um, connecting over people but not really connecting in real life. So I think that's something that could change, like make technology so technical that it doesn't feel like that anymore. But really going back to like you know nature, simple things, family relationships. Uh, Hedgehogs. Yeah. Hedgehogs. <laughs> okay. So I'll pick, pick a couple and go back. This is a question for Sophia. I would love for you to impart some advice on the crowd with regards to, I think, as creatives and human beings, there's a resistance when you feel the desire to try something new or become someone new. It's like, well, I can't do that because I'm a writer. I can't do that because I'm a photographer. I'm not supposed to do this. Um, you went from med school to photographing flowers captured in ice. Um, how do you make that transition and what advice do you have? Is there uh, a piece of um, insight or a little bit of motivation you can give us, um, you know, for, for people who feel stuck or perhaps a little bit leery? Okay. 
Um, I was going to start my speech with two quotes, and I didn't use them because it sounds really scary. But one I have is that to live, like, to live a life of creativity, you have to lose your fear of being wrong. And the second is, it takes everything to stand alone in a world where everyone is trying to make you the same. And I grew up with that, like, I'm Asian. And, okay, the hardest part was, in Asia, art is like, oh, you do art, you stop the death. <laughs> That's like, all of my relatives were thinking of that. Um, and it has been really hard overcoming that because that was what I grew up with. But it's almost like, if you get past that, there's really nothing that stops you. And one of the hardest things, I think, being in creative is really trying to be yourself. You know, like you meet people, you're like, oh, I gotta impress this crowd. Like, oh yeah, like professional photographer, extravagant. Like, and it gets really fancy, but I feel like at the end, just stay true to who you are, stay true to your voice. Cause it's like, if you're gonna try to be someone else, like the world has a lot of that already. And the best thing I could do is, I don't know, like hedgehogs, flowers, ice, white things, Asian jokes. <laughs> like, that's where I encourage like people to be. <laughs> Those specific things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For all three of you, if time was suddenly limited, you only had a month left, what would you do with that time? <laughs> I have to answer that first. Um, I mean, I, this obvious, probably maybe cliche answer is just to spend it with people and as, get as much people time as I can. I mean, the difficult thing about how short our lives are is that um, there's often a lot of great people that you don't get to spend as much time with as you maybe would want, and uh, it's great if we can always be making that time as we go, but um, my guess would be that if I heard that, that my mind would immediately go to the people that I want to spend time with. So maybe like, as soon as inspirational, it's like, I would make the best art ever, and then it would be last forever, but I think that's probably what I would do. Yeah, I think we're gonna see a bit of a theme with this question. Because it's gonna be the opposite answer to if you had all the time in the world, I'm gonna make type bases. But if I only have a month left, I'm gonna spend it with my three month old, who's at the back there, being very quiet and good. <laughs> um, yeah, people. That's what it kind of comes back to, I guess. And I would, yeah. My, my answer is the same. I think I had this favor of like, oh, I'm gonna change the world, make the best art that's out there. You know, like, it's so raw and it's so pink and so beautiful. But now it's like, well, I'm here in Canada, my family's in Taiwan, I was like, honestly, like, I don't even want to be here. <laughs> so, go home and spend it with family. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's leave it there, but I want to make a comment. The, the, the time is precious spent with people thing, uh, while I was listening to you, I was looking at this artwork, and it occurs to me how terrifying that is. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I know, but it's like so like Alice in Wonderland and 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 and, and Salvador Dali and and it's this and it made me think that you know time is really precious and scary. Time is scary because we can't fight it; it will beat us all. So the thought I would leave you with, as I thank Sophia and Alana and, and Ellen for doing this, is that we all took time to be here together today. We are the same kind of people. We're not drawing letter forms, we're not making apps, we're not on our computers. We're talking to each other and talking about what we can be as a city, as creatives, as people, as a community, and that's really important. So let me ask you this question. Before you guys go off the stage and take a bow, what do you think about this format, audience on the stage? Should we do it again? Can we maybe just make this a standard and take a vote and just make this every December, uh, kind of wrap the year up? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. All in favor, stand up. Okay, sure. Thank you guys very, very much for this.